One of the rewarding things of having a YouTube channel is learning that your content is appreciated. I've been gratified by the number of thoughtful posts in the comments section. One of my favorite parts of reading the comments, and I do read all of them, is when someone points out something I've not thought of or perhaps even gotten completely wrong. I'm grateful to those who take the time to constructively point this out. The study of history is a constant process of learning, evaluating, and ultimately re-evaluating what we think we know. Interaction is a necessary part of this process. So I wanted to highlight and respond specifically to one question that came up in the comments section of the video on German army uniforms. And before I begin, let me say up front that I would find it easier to take the question seriously if it wasn't coming from a cartoon hillbilly. Having said that, to be honest, my initial response to Boomhauer is probably more abrupt than it needed to be. Boomhauer wanted to know if the colors were accurate. Yeah, it's a great question. And my written response was poor, not to mention we're talking about colors instead of showing them. So let me try again. Now I will admit that in creating the video in question, which was a timeline of the basic uniform, I was less concerned about nailing a specific set of colors and focused more on how the uniform details and insignia combinations changed over time. When I went to create the artwork, I admit that instead of consulting a collection of vintage uniforms, I instead took the briefest of glimpses at my replica uniforms and then dialed up a color I thought would be suitable for viewing in the video. I could leave my answer at that, having admitted to not really being concerned about an authentic color as opposed to, say, a representative shade. But let's take a look at Boomhauer's follow-up. He gives a hexadecimal code and claims that it is the most common adaptation in media. He goes on to say, I'm a non-commercial digital artist. Feldgrau is a much darker shade and can almost resemble a dark shade of green, depending on other elements on the uniform. Well, he raises a great point. The interpretation of a color is going to rely on a number of things. Yes, if a green uniform has, say, black accoutrements, the base color will seem darker to human eyes. To that, you can add a whole host of circumstances which would alter the color of an object, including lighting, for just one. So let's look at some better examples of original tunics from a collector. Among my many personal go-tos for information is Chris Pittman, who hosts a number of resources on Facebook and the web. He's done a lot of research using surviving garments and has generously shared it. This photograph on his website, which I linked to below, is actually one of the first images a Google search finds for the term field gray. Already we can see that surviving garments are in a variety of shades, all of which can be described as field gray. Let's compare the artwork from the uniform video on this channel to these garments. I've cut and pasted directly from the artwork, and while there's no exact match, one does come close. And I think it is fair to say that Boomhauer's comment about our shade being too bright is probably fair. But let's examine a couple of Boomhauer's other claims. The hexadecimal code provided by Boomhauer is easily converted into its corresponding color, and we can use the screen capture tool to similarly compare a digital swatch to the photo of the surviving garments. I'll leave it to the viewer to see if it is easy to find a match between the swatch and the surviving garments. We can also redo the artwork in the video with the quote-unquote correct field gray color and compare it to the surviving wartime color photography. First we show the correct shade that Boomhauer supplied. And compare it to the original incorrect color of the video. Again, I leave it to the viewer to decide which is a closer match. This is another contemporary color photograph which we can use to compare the artwork colors to. The color in the video is quite bright, but seems to be a fair artistic representation of the fabric worn by the soldier in the photograph. The quote-unquote correct hexadecimal color shows up quite dark once again. So let's compare a series of photos, both contemporary color photos as well as studio shots of surviving uniforms with both the lighter color used in the video, shown at the bottom of the screen, and the darker, correct shade of field gray identified by the hexadecimal code by Boomhauer at the top of the screen.
This online collection of uniforms has a variety of field blouses from different periods of the war. Every soldier received multiple sets of clothing, which received hard use, particularly by the men in the frontline branches. The ravages of sunlight and hard wear caused the color of uniform fabric to shift noticeably through a combination of ultraviolet light and the continual wearing down of the nap of the wool. Some reenactors call this aging, but if that was true, if age alone could shift the color of a uniform, there would be no mint condition uniforms in museums or private collections, which isn't the case. Sweathering is another factor in comparing surviving uniforms to our perception of correct color shades. Another claim Boomhauer makes is that the color of our artwork resembles the horizon blue of French infantry in the First World War. Yes, it's fair to say the intensity of the shades do seem to match, so did we get it wrong? Now before we go any further, I need to apologize. The cartoon character Jeff Boomhauer is not a hillbilly, but a citizen of the great state of Texas. My visits to Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio have all left me with a great deal of affection for Texans, so let me both pay tribute and provide another example of color interpretation that may be useful. Colors are incredibly important in the world of professional sports, and it should be no surprise that pro teams around the world have clearly defined color palettes. Modern garment makers have achieved an unprecedented level of quality control, far better than anything that would have been possible in wartime Germany, whose industries were being bombed around the clock, and were forced to make do with shrinking supplies of natural resources, augmented by artificial components, assembled in many cases by slave labor. All of which leads to an incredibly awkward segue to the subject of Tony Romo, former quarterback of the world-famous Dallas Cowboys football team. Before 2019, this blue jersey was rarely seen on the field as the Cowboys bucked tradition by wearing the traditional white away jersey at home, as well as most games on the road. Even in 2019, when the Cowboys were blue for half their games, the total number of jerseys produced for the team would have been a fraction of the millions of field blouses necessary to outfit the German army. And yet, as we pull out swatches of the jersey photos and compare to each other, we see the same lack of color consistency of these relatively rare jerseys as we do in pictures of military uniforms. And I know what you're thinking. The photos are taken in different lighting conditions, the images come from different types of photographic techniques, maybe the jerseys were even made by different manufacturers. But that's the whole point. It is incredibly difficult to find an image of a jersey that exactly matches the official Pantone, despite modern things like color fast dyes and digital photography. And if we can't do that for a modern sports jersey, why would anyone believe there was just one correct shade of wartime field gray? Now, Boomhauer seemed very confident that the hexadecimal code he provided referred to the official color of field gray. And you may not expect to hear this, but he's exactly right. And if you own a copy of the book Real Colors of World War II, you've probably been waiting for me to get to the discussion of RAL codes. RAL was created in 1925 as a partnership between German industry and government out of a desire to standardize specific colors for industrial applications. The system was successful and in a modified form is still in use today. And if you look at the wartime RAL color 6006 from the group 840R, you find a shade named Field Gray. The shade has been renumbered since the war, but still exists in the RAL system as shade 7009. And this is how the color compares with the hexadecimal code that Boomhauer supplied. It's pretty close. Much in the way of surviving German equipment can be found today in a similar dark gray-green shade. Emphatically, however, none of them are made of cloth. There's passing reference in the book to field gray being the color of German uniforms, but significantly, other books specifically about uniforms and written in great detail, such as this one, don't mention the RAL standard at all. Photos and references all seem to indicate that the RAL color, known as field gray, was used as a shade of paint used on such items as first aid kits, helmets, gas mask canisters, and mess tins. So we haven't talked about some other things, such as the fact we're using a single homogeneous color to portray a textured surface like uniform cloth, which has obvious disadvantages, and again, realism isn't the point so much as getting a general idea across. I mean, cartoon faces look nothing like human skin. If they did, we would be about as far into the uncanny valley as this. And that's probably a place we don't want to go. So if anyone ever tells you that they know what the correct color of field gray cloth is, politely point them to the links in the description below. Or, of course, this video. And as a final note for Boomhauer, if you want to successfully pass for Texan, you're going to have to curb your British Commonwealth tendencies.